Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, announcements we have on March 9th, our prospective student visitor today. So that day will feature, it just happens to be before PAA is here, and so that will feature many small talks by our students for our prospective students. So that should be a fun day. That's March 9th coming up. Any other announcements? No? Okay, great. Uh, today we're delighted to have uh, Marcella Alshan visiting from Stanford, uh, where she's an assistant professor of medicine at the Stanford Medical School. Uh, Marcella has a uh, PhD in economics, but she's also an MD. Uh, we know her here uh, for a talk she gave at our conference on health inequality. Was that the topic? Yeah. Um, a paper she did with her advisor, Claudia Golden, on the expansion of uh, water networks in Boston and health outcomes, really neat historical research. And today we're going to see a, a continuation of that theme on historical health, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Marcel also just got a K award from NICHD. And if, for those of you interested in those kind of awards, she would be a good person uh, to talk to. Uh, she had to, you know, to, to, pull, to jostle a little bit to get it, and so it would be a good idea to talk to her also about how she jostled to, to get it. So in this tough, tough funding environment. So, uh, welcome. We're delighted to hear you today. We're not going to get to see all 51 of your slides. We're that's always sad. Okay. <laughs> all right. No, no, that's good. It'll just clean me. Thank you so much for coming. This is still very much a work in progress. It's joint work with Marianne Wanamaker of the University of Tennessee. And we're interested in how the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, the disclosure of it, affected the health of black men. So we were motivated to look at this question by two lines of research in economics. The first is this idea that trust is really important in economic, and for development, particularly in relationships that involve incomplete or asymmetric information. And this is mostly comes out in the gray literature, where they talk about repeated gains and whatnot. But there's another strand of research in development economics, which describes this puzzle of low uptake of really beneficial health products and interventions, particularly among marginalized populations. And why is this a puzzle? It doesn't seem to comport with the predictions of neoclassical economic theory. And so there's been um, a flurry of research on behavioral economics. Are these people, do these people have present bias preferences? Do we need commitment devices, nudges, et cetera? So what is not often discussed, though, is another neoclassical thing that is often omitted from um, these discussions of low demand, which is the belief structure and, and how trust might line up with demand. So the closest thing that we have empirically to what our study will try and do is this research by um, Nathan Nunn and Leonard Wanchikin. They looked at how the export slave trade in Africa <coughs> affected interpersonal trust because a lot of times slaves were sold by people, you know, essentially selling out their family members or relative neighbors, etc. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to bring these two literatures together, this idea that trust is really important when you have incomplete information, which is often the case in, in doctor-patient relationships, as well as this idea that there's a low demand. And we want to at least start with the benchmark model of neoclassical economics to see if we can bring this sort of back into a neoclassical framework and just interpret it as observed behavior that would be predicted under rational expected utility maximization, taking into account how subjective beliefs are formed. Um, because we can't randomize mistrust, I think we might get a little pushback on that from applied micro, but we didn't want to go around priming some black men about Tuskegee and others, we were, that was suggested. Um, we're going to be using this historic episode, which was the disclosure of the study. Um, and for most of this, you in this room, as well as many of us who have taken IRB, you know, human subjects review, the Tuskegee study is probably the most infamous case of medical exploitation, at least in modern <coughs> So conscious of the time, we'll see how much we can get through. Uh, we're going to talk about the background on the Tuskegee. I can be very, very brief on the model, um, but it is helpful in terms of just both to frame our um, predictions as well as to motivate our um, empirical specification, the results, and then the concluding remarks. So 
in some sense, the, the full title of the study says it all. The, the full title of the study was the Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. And so right there, that tells you that the study took place in Tuskegee, Alabama, in Macon County, that it targeted, it all exclusively included black men, and that the entire gamut of the thing was to never treat these men who had syphilis. That was the purpose. And why might you ask would anyone ever do that? Well, it's inconscionable even then, but the purported research question was what is the natural history of the disease? So what happens if we just follow these people, we withhold treatment, we take blood samples, and then when they die, we use their autopsy results. That was the whole research. So, um, so this was a case control study. So they had about 600 mostly illiterate sharecroppers in Macon County that were recruited, 400 of whom had syphilis and 200 of whom did not. And this is the picture of the doctors kind of going down. This is the 1960s. They're not using gloves. Uh, but they're going down, they're collecting blood from, this is a, like a representative patient. Um, and what's really remarkable about the study, at least according to the historical narrative, is that the men didn't actually know they were in a study. So they were um, told that they had syphilis. They were used this euphemistic phrase, bad blood. There's a really um, important book on this whole topic called Bad Blood. And um, they, they thought they were under treatment. So they were receiving sort of symptomatic relief with aspirin and checkups, et cetera. Um, but they were actively, in 1945 or 1947, the penicillin came onto the market, became mass produced. Actually, the same organization that carried out the study, the US Public Health Service, was instrumental in the studies that proved that penicillin was, a, in fact, reliable treatment for, for um, syphilis. And yet, these men were actively prevented from obtaining treatment to the point that the US Public Health Service, USPHS, recommended that when recruiting for World War II, all the recruits be both screened and then, if positive, treated for syphilis. Many of these men were called up for World War II for, for recruitment, and the US Public Health Service told the draft board, you can't treat these men. Um, and, and they complied. So, um, so what did they get out of it? Uh, not much. Routine checkups, hot meals, burial payments, and then um, it lasted for these 40 years. So what actually happened in terms of the disclosure, there was someone internal who in the 1960s tried to actually change things at the CDC. It prompted a huge internal review on the ethics of it. There's a lot of notation and a lot of archival history from these big review boards. And in fact, what they determined, shockingly at that time, now we're in the 1960s, was that the study was valid, ethical, and it should continue. So then, in 1970s, the same person, um, Buxby, actually was at a dinner party with someone from the AP and told the story to, and the Associated Press got hold of it, and it was published as part of this multi-article expose. And this is just one sort of graphic of you know, a cartoon, free autopsy, free burial, plus a $100 bonus. Um, so based on all of that, we hypothesized that the Tuskegee study on treated syphilis, or TSUS, generated mistrust of the medical profession, thereby affecting health-seeking behavior and health outcomes for African-American men in particular, who were the subjects of the study in the years following the 1972 disclosure. And we're going to use a difference and difference and differences framework, or a triple difference framework, in order to uh, try and causally estimate these results, and I'll give you a detailed description of that. But what are sort of the motivating evidence? Obviously, I've told you the story. It's fairly horrible. What about what, what else is in the historical narrative or in the medical literature? So anecdotally, Tuskegee is often associated with deep distrust of the medical profession, particularly among men of the same demographic. So this is work. This woman is at UNC. She's an epidemiologist. And she's done a lot of work showing that this Tuskegee study became a symbol of their mistreatment by the medical establishment, a metaphor for deceit, conspiracy, malpractice, and neglect, if not outright genocide. This is the book, James Jones, who said it had uh, inflicted a lot of damage on the collective psyche of black Americans. I don't know if any of you watch ABC's Blackish. I tend to actually like it. <laughs> um, but it, it's a, a sitcom on a black uh, family, um, middle class family in America. And the, um, the father, the, the father of the protagonist, the grandfather, so to speak, Samuel Fishborn, didn't want to, he was having severe chest pain, didn't want to go to see the doctor, and the whole episode begins with this 
a recapitulation of Tuskegee. And I would say that there's a lot of qualitative and quantitative studies on how medical mistrust is correlated with low precipitation in clinical trials, delays in preventative health care, but these are mostly, I mean, they're all correlations. They're not really trying to identify anything. And I think we can kind of, you know, we could um, debate about the quality of a lot of these studies. But just actually last month in the New York Times, um, they reported on this horrible tuberculosis outbreak in, um, in a county, Marion County in Alabama, and they referenced the Tuskegee study and this, this sort of um, ingrained mistrust that is prevalent in that community. But as many of you know, or um, at least from in the, if you only reading the economics literature, and I should say that we had to write a pre-analysis plan, go through all of these permissions at the um, NCHS, all of which we were happy to do. <laughs> um, but uh, we were a little bit wary of starting starting this process, this huge, you know, trying to get access to all this restricted data. Um, without having a, a little bit of something to go on, uh, despite all the historical literature and the narrative and such, if you were just reading the economics literature, the takeaway message would be that the late 1960s, early 1970s was a period of black-white overall convergence on a di many different measures. So the best health outcomes paper is this work by Almond Chain Greenstone, which looks at the desegregation of hospitals which was required as part of um, Medicare, to receive Medicare funding, hospitals had to desegregate. And that paper shows a huge convergence in black and white mortality rates. I know that you're most very familiar with the work of Andrew Goodman Bacon, also showing convergence at this time. And then there's work in the QJE by um, Elizabeth Cassio from Dartmouth and Abanya Washington from Yale. And they also find that after the Equal Rights Amendment was passed, there was huge inflows of federal funding and other funding to, um, to places that had uh, literacy requirements on voting records, et cetera. So basically, huge cash flows from the federal government going into these areas that were, um, that were in the South. So all of this kind of speaks to this idea that there was convergence going on. And in fact, we see convergence. So what we're plotting here is that the blue line is the difference between black, white, male mortality rates. And the red line is the difference between female, black, white, female mortality rates. And this is just age specific mortality rates, so infant deaths per birth, and then children is one to four over that relevant population. So this is just the compressed mortality files from the CDC. And you know, you see this pretty significant convergence. And this is kind of what I, I, I only had this slide at the last meeting. But we see that that pattern is very, very different for older black men. So older black men, we see them converging um, prior to Tuskegee, kind of consistent with all of the other literature. And then that convergence um, becomes a divergence. And if you look at this in levels, this is really driven by two factors. It's driven by white men continuing to go down, their death rates continuing to go down, as well as the fact that Black men stagnate, stagnate, and their death rates start to go up. So it's actually a combination of stagnation and reversal. So that was just motivating evidence for us to continue on this path of going through the, the disclosure process. So oftentimes in economics, our, our talks are like an hour and a half, so people want to see the findings up front. <laughs> yes, Jeff? Can, can you just go back yes. and tell me what? Yeah. What's the? What would we expect to see? So this would, if people were going to the doctor and that's saving lives and causing mortality rates, then maybe their behavior would immediately translate into yeah. a change in the trend. But it's almost too. I mean, we would expect health behaviors to build up over many years, many decades. So we would expect the effect to be seen. I would guess 10, 20, 30 years later, not two years later. Yeah, so this goes out, this goes out in time, um, and I would say that this is a reversal that builds up over yeah. time. So this is consistent with, now we could have plotted this by cohorts, this is just us again, just yeah. sort of taking the data, kind of running roughshod with it. But what, what we think here is that these guys were affected, you know, these guys were learned about Tuskegee in their late 30s, early 40s, when some of their health-seeking behavior, <coughs> not exactly your question, I'll get to it. Yeah. Um, when some of their health care, you know, they could stop smoking, they could have 
cut back on their drinking, and this leading to higher death rates here. I should say that, um, so, so I think that some stuff is happening mo much more with the lab. There is some things that are happening here as well, but it's not inconsistent with the idea that, um, for example, for blood pressure, there are some things that we can do immediately that do help, like treat your blood pressure, prevent a stroke, prevent a heart attack. And there are some things that, and this is what an, another thing that really kind of contributes to this lagged part, which is the staging of your cancer. So if you come in earlier, we can either save you, or we can kind of keep you alive for longer. So I think we're picking up both of those effects. This is, of course, not, this is not the identified part. This is just the, the raw data. We're not sort of saying that this is all Tuskegee as of yet. It's, it's purely motivational at this point. OK. So what do we find? We find a significant decrease in outpatient physician interactions following Tuskegee, a decrease in hospitalizations, and an increase in mortality. Our effects are strongest for black men, who we assume, who we hypothesize and model would be most affected by these news. And we also find that those with prior experience with the medical community, including both women and veterans, are less affected. And I'll explain why we think that might be right now. So, yes? The first point there, is that across all race, ethnic groups, or is, are you looking at African Americans only? We're compared, well, in our triple. In a, you say significant decrease in outpatient physician. The first bullet point. Is that true of the entire population? It's, it's true mainly for uh, black men as compared to either white men or as compared to black women. So, everything that we'll be doing is sort of is a difference within a difference within a difference. So in order to kind of cement ideas, we have a multi-period model of belief formation and health-seeking behavior. And we're going to have agents who are going to age, and as they age, they have to, at the end of the um, aging period, they have to make a decision about seeking preventative health care. So at equal zero, all agents are born with a common, uninformed prior about the state of the world. If theta is one, the state is good, and Q doctors, Q share of doctors are beneficent or trustworthy. Uh, for ease of exposition, we're going to consider a symmetric Bayesian signal, so that Q is Q prime, and Q prime would be the relevant um, parameter if we were thinking about the bad state of the world. At T equals 1, agents will now enter young adulthood, and some of them will be required to obtain medical care either due to the pregnancy or because they're conscripted into military service, and they have to be made sure that they're fit to fight. These agents are going to update using Bayes' rule about based on the experience that they received um, and then at T equals 2, agents will again age. Now they'll be older age or older um, adulthood. And those who are more proximate to Tuskegee will learn about the experiment and update. And then at the end of the period, all agents will maximize their expected utility of seeking out medical care based on both their subjective beliefs about whether the theta equals 1 or 0, as well as the payoffs. What does proximate mean? So proximate, we're going to define in three different ways. If you'll give me two slides, I'll tell you about. But what we can do here is we can now have a matrix of posteriors where we have those who are experienced and un unexperienced, near to the event and far from the event. So just as a quick answer to your question, we're thinking about um, proximity both in sort of geographic terms and in cultural terms. We're, there's two states of the world. One is a state of the world where only some people learn about Tuskegee and those people who are closer to um, the event or hear more about it, or hear more of the boring, boring details about it. But we actually think we're in the second state of the world, given that 97% of the newspaper articles that we find on Tuskegee were actually um, from the AP wire, so that this was a, sort of picked up wherever the AP is picked up. Um, we think that we are in the second state of the world where almost everybody heard about it, but those whose behavior is going to be affected by it most um, impactfully are going to be those who identify most nearly with the study subjects, those who think to themselves, this could, this could have happened to me. Um, so that's what we mean, mean by near. And then the trick will be the ways that we parameterize that, which will be both distance, social networks, through fraction of migrants coming from Alabama, and as well as newspaper coverage. So yes, that's the answer I was going to give in three slides, but that's, this is a good chance to say it. 
So what this actually gives us is a hierarchy of posteriors. So what is the, my uh, posterior that the state of the world is good, conditional on my prior, the signal I got at the doctor if I went to the doctor, if I was compelled to go because of the draft of pregnancy, as well as, um, as, well as the Tuskegee signal, if I was proximate enough to receive that signal. The payoffs are as simple as they can get. They're ones or zeros. Yes? How does signal formation occur through those two events that you described, or is it just through, through those two events? Yeah, so it's through prime, this. It's a very simple, okay. yes, exactly. So it's actually supposed to be dropped as a man to... Right, okay. or pregnant as a woman. So we're going to be looking at people 45 to 74 years of age. So we're looking at older age people, and we're thinking that these were the experiences they had prior to that. We wanted to compare black men to black women and kind of take out the reproductive factor, essentially. Which year were, sorry, this is probably a historical question, but which yeah. year would have been exposed to the draft? So, uh, we'll, we'll, um, so we're thinking about men that were actually within the military, so we'll be comparing veterans to non-veterans, and it's somewhere around 30%. In, in, in the last, when we get to channels, that's what we'll be doing. Yeah. Does it go to 1250? Yeah, 12 50, 12 50, 12 Okay, then I think we'll get there. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the payoff function. It's, it's payoffs, they're very straightforward. The payoffs depend on the action you take and the state of the world. One, if you actually go to the doctor and the state is good, zero otherwise. And then there's a cost function, which of course is not dependent on the state of the world. You decide whether to go see the doctor before the state is realized. And um, what we can all this boils down to is that a rational agent will seek out medical care in old age if and only if the expected utility of doing so um, dominates the expected utility of not doing so, which brings everything down to a threshold rule. You only go if your posterior is high enough, where high enough is represented by this omega expression. Now, you can start taking comparative statics and get really sensible things like you're more likely to see the doctor if the cost is low or the benefits are high. But what we're really interested in is taking that hierarchy of posteriors I showed you on the last slide and mapping that into behavior. So this gives us some sensible, well, we think sensible implications, which that health-seeking behavior will be more negatively affected by Tuskegee for those who are culturally and geographically more proximate to the events we think um, as, as measured by whether they're a black man versus white men, a black <coughs> man versus black women. Now that's not to say that these other groups might not be affected at all, it's just to say that, again, we're thinking that these are the people that are going to mostly identify with those subjects and think that something like that could happen to them. And again, black men closer to Tuskegee to black men farther from Tuskegee. We actually do have survey data from something called the Survey of Black Americans at this time, which actually asks the question, who do, you, um, who do you empathize with most? What groups? And we find that black men in the South are more likely to um, empathize with uh, poor black Americans, um, which is, which is uh, very interesting because those would have been the subject, the study subjects were essentially illiterate sharecroppers. And then we have the second prediction on experience. So we think that if the state of the world well, we can prove that if the true state of the world is actually theta is equal to 1, that actually most doctors were on average beneficent during this time, so that on average most people who actually went to the doctor for either pregnancy care or as part of, the, um, as part of their military service had an overall on average um, beneficial experience, then we get the predictions that black men, since they're not generally going to see the doctor, non-veteran black men, um, will have more negative impact of Tuskegee than black women, and black men more so than veteran black women. Now, I should say that this is in the immediate aftermath. I think, so we've, also, we've often gotten the question, well, could this change over time? And I think that that could definitely be the case. So, but, I, but our identification strategy cannot be used to say, like, what is the effect of Tuskegee on health seeking behavior today? Marcel, sorry, yes, I, I don't right. want to slow you down, but it, so you're not looking at, at or thinking about households, it sounds like, which was, I think is yeah. reasonable. I mean, so the yeah, show black yeah. is right. I mean, yeah. it's a black mom yeah. and a black dad, so black women are married to black men, probably right. in many right. cases, right. but you're right. thinking that, well, oh, the black men make the choices for themselves and their wives could do other things, and it sounds like they perhaps are. Yeah. 
No, it's a good point. So why is information shared within the household? So we think that if you see, um, so we don't have a, this is, you know, empirically this is what we observe. Um, but in addition, I think it's, we also control for marital status. So to the extent that, you know, we're comparing, their, well, you'll see the specification in your moment. We're comparing black men versus, um, before versus after Tuskegee and states or places nearer versus farther before and after the disclosure. And so we're basically, um, the marginal effect that we're isolating, I might already absorb, absorb the fact that, for instance, married people are more likely to go to see the doctor than unmarried people, or more influenced than their spouse by not unmarried people. I would say the other thing is that to the extent that, you know, this wife had a positive signal from her experience being pregnant, and is you know developed this pattern of health seeking behavior. And she always goes no matter what. Maybe her signal isn't an informative to you as her husband because you think, well, she's always going. You know, it's not like she's making a decision. She developed this behavior and she's always going. But it's true that we're we're not that moderately in the sense like that as a household. And there's no other information as well. It's just information only derived from going to the doctor. That's right. Going to the doctor and then just keep two signals. That's all. Yeah. Um, so we actually do have um, data on medical mistrust from the general social survey. It's it's all post Tuskegee, so we have a different identification strategy for that. We have this is what took the the many many months to obtain the National Health Interview Survey um, from 1969 to 1977 are the years where both race is coded consistently and the outcome measure of physician interactions in the last 12 months is coded consistently. So that's the that time period that we're restricted to with that. Um, we also have, as I alluded to, utilization data from hospitals, etc. Um, and then we have the CDC publicly available compressed mortality files from 1968 to 1988, though we start in the same year as the utilization data. Um, the question is a good question. During the past, I mean, empirically for us, because it's a, we we're looking for sharp contemporaneous changes, and we get that with that question. During the past 12 months, how many times did this person see or talk to a doctor? The raw mortality data you're probably familiar with, it's county level, it's, it's ag, um, Disaggregated by age group, sex, race, and cause, and year. We, for our purposes, we aggregate the county level to the SEA level. Since I mentioned before, we're looking only at people 45 to 74 years of age, and we just don't have counts high enough to actually calculate this for black men in lots and lots of counties if we stuck to county level data at the annual level. We get the same regression results, <coughs> a lot larger. Um, and we do two things. We generate both an age-adjusted older mortality rate for these groups, as well as generate cause-specific mortality rate for these groups. For so what's SEA? Oh, sorry, state economic area. So it's, a, it's usually okay. three or four counties. Um, for Nevada, it's one. <laughs> Um, so we test this, so we're going to, so the hypothesis again that we're interested in is that black men who were more informed about Tuskegee or who more identified with the individuals in the study would be more affected than those who, um, who would be more affected than other groups of men, right? And uh, we want to test this with a triple difference framework. So the, the coefficient of interest here is the beta, and to unpack the triple, the, the P is the proximity variable. So how close are you geographically or culturally to this, the, this subpopulation in Tuskegee that was experimented on? We're going to parameterize that three ways using either geographic distance, um, migrant data, or newspaper data. We, our workforce, I'll just say right now, is distance um, because uh, that's what we started with. That was in our pre-analysis plan, but we've expanded it just to kind of deal with any other Concerns that people might have. Some people don't like distance. Post is a post variable for 1972, and group is an indicator for what demographic group do you belong to? Are you a black man? So what? Okay. So let me just finish. So black man, um, white man. Um, it's an indicator for either black in a male sample or male in a black sample, and the same is true for a 
female sample and a white sample. So in a female sample, group is black, and in a, in a white sample, um, group is male. So as you can see, if we run it on four different samples, it actually adds to the richness of our story because we can test that these effects should be much, much stronger <coughs> um, among black men when comparing them to white men than if you compare black females to white females. These effects, we think, based on our the history, historical narrative as well as our model, should be much, much stronger among black men as compared to black women than white men versus white women. We're not saying that other groups should be unaffected completely, but we expect the betas to be much larger for um, when we're comparing black men to either white men or, or white women, uh, or black women. And then for the NHIS data, we can include all of these other control variables, demographic, SES, background variables. Um, and for the CDC variables, we don't, for the CDC data, we don't have these individual level controls. The trade-off is that the NHIS level data this far back only has state level identifiers, geographic identifiers, whereas, um, whereas the, the mortality data has SEA or state economic area. So the other thing that's nice about this triple difference framework is it allows us to non-parametrically control for location-specific time effects that are common across demographic groups using this gamma variable. So you know the federal rollout of Medicare or Medicaid or changes in the Social Security um, law that might have trickled down to different states differently um, or different state-run Medicaid programs, as well as we can also control for shocks any um, group-specific shocks. So we can account for changes that are affecting blacks at any point in time with our year fixed effects. So it's a pretty flexible framework. The only thing we're not dummying out, so to speak, is state black, state demographic group fixed effects, which in fact we do in the most um, rigorous version of our, of our specification. And we can show that the beta is statistically distinguishable from the slightly more parametric version. But um, okay, so that's the, that is that, this is, this is the two graphs that I have for you. So, I don't know if you can see, this is Tuskegee right here. And so, essentially we're parameterizing distance linearly, so it's almost as if, you know, think about like a, a impact happening right here, an asteroid falling here, and then we're, it's radiating out in circles. So in some of our robustness tests, we're going to limit it just to the south, and we can show that our results for mortality, in fact, get, get stronger there. For fraction of migrants from Alabama, it's actually highly correlated with distance, but it gives us, this is based on the 1940 census, there's a question about where you were five years ago, and since these migration patterns are generally stable over time, and older men typically migrated younger in life, we think these are the relevant migration patterns to use. Um, and so these, these are the two things that we've mapped for you today. And then we have the, the, the number of local black newspapers as the third treatment. Yeah? So, so with, the, with the paragraph for distance, yeah. the intuition is not that distance is capturing immediate coverage, but that, that distance is capturing the saliency of the coverage? Yeah, so we're, you know, in fact, if you read the historical, it, Bad Blood, for instance, says that a lot of this went through social networks, like that people talked about it a lot. Um, so we're kind of agnostic. It's very reduced form. Um, we're kind of thinking that this is potentially capturing both, how, how, how likely you were to read about it, as well as given that conditional on reading it, uh, conditional on hearing about it, how, most, how closely you identified with those subjects in it. You can imagine that media coverage would be inversely related to distance if conservative outlets in the South covered it less than. So we're looking at sorry, we're looking at black local news, local black newspapers. So it's a no, 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 in, just in distance, not in press coverage. But if in distance there was less. So in distance, these things are actually positively correlated. So there are more local black newspapers outside of the major metropolitan areas like Chicago and New York. There are more black local newspapers in the South. Right, but, but well, I'll talk about it. No, no, what? Well, I just thought this was a separate measure for media coverage, this distance measure that you were showing in the math. <clears throat> yes, and I'm saying that those are positively correlated. Distance with number of newspapers. Yes, ah, yes. Okay, gotcha. okay. Because again, we're looking at local black newspapers. 
So this is not the Gen Scout data. They're not in the Auto Bureau circulations because you're only in the Auto Bureau circulations if you want to attract advertising. Black local newspapers were not big advertisers. So if you look at the Gen Scout data, you don't find other than um, other than the Crusader, you don't find any other black publications. So we had to go to three different data sources to compile a list of black local newspapers. All right, so beta measures the differential impact of the Tuskegee closure on black men relative to white men in the years following 1972 per thousand miles proximity to Macon <coughs> County or per fraction Alabama migrants relative to the difference between the two groups in the years prior. And I think I already said about full non-parametric control. So here's our event study. So what we're going to show you first before we move to the tables is we're going to show you how this trivial difference of proximity post and being black or being within black sample male changes over time in relationship to the timing of the disclosure of the study. And uh, yeah, and we're, as I mentioned, controlling flexibly for all these other things. So here is our coefficient. Here is time. And you can see that we're using state level variation, so it's a little bit noisy here, but we can see this level shift in physician interactions in the last 12 months that occurs um, in the triple difference coefficient, even, either if we're looking at within male, the coefficient on black post proximity, or within black, the coefficient on male post proximity. And then to your point, Joshua, about the this being a little bit lagged in this triple difference framework where we think we're actually identifying Tuskegee as supposed to just um, plotting the raw data, we do see this sort of buildup that's happening and only becomes significant over time. So it doesn't seem quite as sudden as it did in the, in the just the straight in the, um, in the raw data analysis of it all. So now we can move, now we're going to move to a, a table framework so we can kind of summarize the results and subject them to a whole lot of robustness checks. So in, this is the structure that I mentioned before. We're going to be looking at four samples, male, black, female, white, and this is panel A and panel B. This is a measure of the intensive margin, how often you're going to the doctor, how many, the number of visits in the last 12 months. But because this is highly skewed, we also used actually a different variable on interval since last visit to construct this, whether or not you had any visit in the last 12 months or on the extensive margin. And we see effects on both. So if we're comparing black men to white men, we see about a 1.9 um, visit drop in the last 12 months. As I mentioned, this data is, is skewed, and I should say visits here is a little bit of a misnomer. It's any physician interaction, including a telephone call. So we're seeing, um, so the mean here is actually 4.3. And this is about, you can think of one standard deviation as about 1,000 kilometers. So as you move 1,000 kilometers closer to Tuskegee, you get this additional 1.867 drop. So what we've done here on the bottom is we've actually calculated the effect at um, different black population centroids throughout states. So here's the effect in California, Illinois, Tennessee, and Alabama, um, just to kind of give you a, a sense of the gradient here. Um, here's the same thing for the within black sample. It's a smaller in magnitude, suggesting that, you know, in comparison to, to um, white men, maybe black women were somewhat affected by the news. The coefficient is smaller, the, the standard errors are such that you can't reject equality, and the same thing is calculated down here. Finally, we do this same thing. We see a li little bit of a negative coefficient here, though it's not significant for women. And for whites, we see really nothing going on. And then we look again for no on the extensive margin, and we see an increase. So now we've kind of reversed the signs where we actually see an increase in the probability that you don't have any visit with the doctor in the last 12 months. Um, and sort of the rest of the explanation of the table is the same. Yeah. So are you, are you able to condition on whether or not they have health insurance? So we have uh, state year fixed effects in this model. So this would take into account you know, the rollout of, of any particular programs. And we also look at the um, but this is not a variable that's uh, included as a control variable here. Yeah. So just so I understand, the, the, the minus six on Alabama yeah. means that on average people were not going to the doctor at all before they were going four times and now they're going minus two times? Yeah, so, so this is, um, you've correctly identified some of the 
um, the quandaries of, of extrapolating beyond <laughs> what is what is potentially uh, reasonable. So these are not distances. Uh, this distance is, you know, this is the average. I'd have to show you what the average is in Alabama to know how feasible this is. This is more informative, at least, to think about the gradient in and of itself. So these are not out, this is not the average for Alabama. This is the, this is the coefficient at this zero the, zero distance. This is Alabama. the co yeah. yeah this okay. is this exactly. This is the coefficient multiplied by these three things. This is the marginal effect to get the actual number of visits. You would have to do a lot of adding up of all of the other. Um, Variables. But uh, do, do you have data on Alabama in your and I? Yes, guidance? Alabama is in our data set. Yes. And so do you actually, if you just if we just look at the number of visits in Alabama, we it can't look at the to, number of visits to Alabama because we can't know the state. The state identifier is we just have fake state identifiers in our data that we use in the restricted data center. Yeah. So this is the National Health Interview Survey. Correct. What's happening to Black men's non-response rates? Yeah, yeah. So you're, that's a great question. Um, so we tried. To, so this is the National Health Interview Survey, and actually, I should have an appendix slide which shows that if you, at the very top, it's the um, it's the public health service. This is the public health service, the same public health service that ran. Nobody talking to you. Yeah, I know, I know. So we. Um, we think we're estimating the lower bound, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no, we're, we can't. We've tried to see if we can get anything out of survey weights. Like, did they have to upweight blacks in certain areas? But since we can't know, so what happens when you apply to the RDC is they do all the data merging, you know, offsite, and then they give you some fake state identifiers. So, of course, we could easily. No, I'm not going to say anything else. You so, know that this is just No, so <laughs> we're on candid camera. So, um, so, so the point is that we can't know that. We can't disclose that. Um, right. So now here is what we it happens if we look at age-adjusted mortality rates. The pattern is very similar um, in terms of just increasing as you get closer to Tuskegee. I'll have to put more thought into Josh's questions about like this is extrapolating, um, not extrapolating, but just you know how to. How to <coughs> in terms of the mean, here the mean at least is 25 per thousand um, in this age-adjusted mortality. Actually, one question for you is we're using the 1940 standard population. Um, so, yes? Did you uh, make the distance uh, nonlinear, a uh, quadratic on the distance? Because one might imagine a falling off of the effect. Yeah, in fact, so in this, you know, being conscious of time, I won't show you all of the graphs that we did, but we actually, for the mortality data where we can know identifiers, we actually see it's fairly linear. Um, yeah. Of course, there's just no blacks really in outside of Chicago, like in big swaths of the country. <laughs> yes. But um, yeah. So then, um, so then we want to we want to move to actually looking at chronic mortality per log chronic mortality per thousand. So here, what I've taken as chronic mortality is mortality from cardiovascular disease cancer, diabetes, respiratory disease related to smoking, so taking out flu and pneumonia, as well as, um, as, well as uh, cirrhosis, GI related diseases like ulcerative disease and cirrhosis. And here again we see that if you compare these coefficients here, we see for the most part that these coefficients actually get bigger, suggesting that, you know, well, first of all, a lot of the dis disease that these men are dying from is chronic diseases, that's another reason that we wanted to focus on this group. We thought that the effects were going to be larger for preventable illnesses, or at least pre pre deaths that you can either um, prevent, like smoking-related deaths, or forestall, um, at, like an early clot cancer, where there's no cure per se, but at least you can, you can have a, a longer life expectancy if you catch it earlier. And so um, here we see these coefficients get bigger. We do see an effect on white men here. However, if we just limit ourselves to the south, that effect is, is, goes away completely. So it, it suggests anyway that comparing white men in the south to comparing white men outside of the south, their behavior might actually, or their outcomes might have actually been somewhat affected. But that's not true um, if you just look within the south, when in fact, the results for black men versus white men and black females versus white females actually get stronger. Okay, so now we have a couple things to say on mechanisms related to hospitalizations. 
So very, now we're just changing the left-hand side variable name HIS data from being visits to whether or not you were um, hospitalized on the extensive margin. And again, we see a two, about a two percentage point reduction in hospitalizations. Again, a little bit smaller comparing black men to black females, potentially related to the idea that they might have, um, that they might have been affected a little bit as well. But interestingly, and we think consistent with the story that they presented later for this study, we find that conditional on being hospitalized, you actually stay longer in the hospital. You stay um, more nights in the hospital. Um, so instead of kind of going through the host of robustness tests, I'll just say that that's robust to all that stuff. <laughs> and we can do all that stuff. So I won't show you, we can do placebo utilization results for children, we can do placebo mortality results for children, we can do this migrant data, newspapers hasn't been disclosed in the utilization data, we can bin it, um, we can bin distance, we can add this completely non-parametric version, we can compare distance from Tuskegee, proximity to Tuskegee to proximity to Dallas, which we pre-specified because it's the same longitudinal band, we can limit to the south, it's less precise, but the coefficients are not different at all. We do the same thing with mortality. We get the same sorts of patterns. Here we, can't, we do have newspapers. It's our data, so we can merge in the newspaper data. We get similar results. Look at the migrants. That's similar. And then the south results I already showed you, they actually get stronger. Now I want to show you the coolest thing. Well, we liked it. So we can take this pin and say, let's pretend that Tuskegee didn't happen in Tuskegee. And, you know, let's pretend that it happened in Detroit, or Madison, Wisconsin, or Dallas, Texas, or et cetera, et cetera. And then we can, so in this version of the world, we actually still controlled for the Tuskegee effect and looked at what the placebo. Now we don't want, we just want to not control for anything, just pretend that Tuskegee happened anywhere else, and let's draw the, let's map out the empirical distribution and see where does our estimate fall in comparison to any other estimates. So this is the mortality data, and this is the visit data. Again, we're using state level variation here. Um, so I, I don't think I'll have time to tell you too much about, this is, the, this is comparing black veterans to non-veterans, assuming that a lot of this was done by the draft, so it's quasi-random assignment. We get similar results to comparing black non-veterans to white non-veterans in terms of utilization. We also use a different identification strategy to just ask the question, how close were you to Tuskegee at the time of its disclosure? Because we can know where you lived when you were 16 and where you currently live based on the GSS, again, restricted identifiers. And using that sort of different, a little bit different identification identification strategy, just a double as opposed to a triple difference, we find that men who were closer to Tuskegee who were black at the time of the disclosure say that they, um, essentially, that they are more likely to disagree with the statement, I trust doctor's judgment about my medical care, and they're more likely to agree with the statement, I worry I'll be denied this treatment or services I need. And what's nice about this survey is that we can actually condition on their general mistrust. There's also another question in the general social survey, just how much do you trust others in general? Okay. So we should probably wrap up. That's well, it. Open the discussion. Don't wrap up. Open okay. Discussion. Okay. Um, those are my concluding results. Comments. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Ron. Um, so one thing we didn't talk about, but it yeah. seems like your research design would let you address, is using the Tuskegee uh, incident as an instrument for identifying the effect <coughs> of visits on uh, healthcare outcomes. Yes, yes, you're right, you're right. Um, and I think this would be a particularly important time in which, because you know I kind of straddle these two worlds when I go and present this in front of. Doctors, they often say, like, well, doctors don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I think this was a really important time, though. Like, 
there were serious breakthroughs in the way that we treat cancer in terms of using multiple drugs and chemotherapy in the 1960s that were being diffused throughout the country at this time. Again, why we have state ear fixed effects to kind of absorb different patterns of diffusion, but these were really game changers in how you treat cancer, and there were game changers in how we treat cardiovascular disease, which were, of course, the two leading causes of death at this time. So I think this is actually a special situation, maybe a uniquely special time, when, uh, when doctors matter, and I feel like I can say that without apology, given that I see patients. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm, I, first of all, I, I think I, I totally believe these results and it would be hard to not believe them. <laughs> um, but I wonder if a robustness check on the time that uh, the Tuskegee disclosure, if you pretend that the time, yeah. is it just a, could it be just a trend? Yeah, yeah. So, so even though we're flexibly, mm -hmm. this is that. So yeah. this is the this is, this is essentially, if we have a false, so what we're doing here is we're, um, we're plotting out the distance from Macon County, Alabama, where Tuskegee is, and the difference in difference coefficients. So it's, in some ways, it's a way to visualize our triple, because we're doing this by SE, SEA. So we're seeing that prior to Tuskegee, there's really no geographic gradient in what the dif difference in difference to coefficient is, which is, um, this is with a false post. So we're just taking the pre-years of data, pre the disclosure, and just saying that, okay, let's just pretend that it was disclosed in 1970 versus 1972. And let's look at mortality patterns between 1968 and 1972. And let's look at the difference in difference between blacks and whites and how that varied with distance from Tuskegee prior. Okay. So this is all a placebo test. We see no geographic gradient. And in fact, we see no average effect of Tuskegee. Now when we move to the actual, um, actual date, this geographic, uh, we see geographic gradient emerges. Again, it's robust to just lopping it off here and being in the south only. And we see all these guys in the south now above the line, suggesting that they were responding in, in, in our model. But yes. Yeah. So um, my prior to the, 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 the legacy of this event with the cross generations, you use children as a placebo. Should I interpret that to mean that the effect of Tuskegee on long-term health care is really limited to these cohorts? Well, that would be an interesting study, and one that I would probably need to discuss with my K advisor, Professor Lee. <laughs> but, um, but in the short run, I would say we were thinking more that the children were um, were their healthcare decisions were being made by women, and that women were less affected. So when those children grow up and eventually are autonomous agents making healthcare decisions for themselves, it's quite possible that they could be affected. We just don't think the geographic gradient, like that, we just don't think that we have the right metrics for this in this proximity measure. We think it's it it just loses weight. Like for example, let's say one wanted to study the effects of Ferguson on trust in the you know, police reporting of crimes among the black community. It really, I think it would be challenging to use distance because first of all, there's so many of these events happening in so many different parts of the country now, sadly, that it's hard to know, do you just choose Ferguson or do you use the Bronx or do you use <laughs> Cleveland or what, you know, San Francisco, what, what are, where do you use with all, the, with all the texting going on? And then there's social media now, so it's like you'd have to be friends with Hal Varian. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, sort of piggybacking on this, it, it is striking how focused these effects are. Yeah. Like, it, it is on black men. Yeah. It is, there are no effects on women that, uh, within the within women comparison, black white. Yeah. Uh, that, that surprised me. I mean, I guess I thought there would be, I guess it speaks to people's reference groups, or people's identity groups, but uh, did. Were you surprised by that? Did you expect that? We actually were not. So we wrote that in our pre-analysis plan. So the only way that we can like get data out of the RDC without twelve hundred dollars in a three to six months lag is um, is is by pre-specifying, and that was all in the original amendment, the original application. That was not an amendment. Why we thought that? Why did we think that that would be the case? Wait, you thought I, I understand that you specified the test, but did you have, did you have, did you have to state your prior on which? On yes, we thought population? that black women would be a control group for black men. Uh, now, it's, uh, so black, black women, women versus white women. white women. 
yeah, I don't know that we explicitly thought, no, I think that was an empirical finding that, that yeah. It's, and, and do you make sense of that as people having very narrow reference groups or something else? Or? It's interesting. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I think narrow reference groups is a is a good is a good. Um, I mean, if you if you believe the model that says like experience, let's say I put different weights on the signal. Now we wanted to keep things everything variation, so we didn't. But like, let's say that my experience trumps anything I hear about. Like, I I have some ideas about what you know what police are like. Um, but I, my home was burglarized, and they were very, very nice to me, and they were very, very helpful for me. And then I hear some awful news about, you know, um, you know, somebody getting pulled over and arrested without probable cause or whatnot. Any of the just choose any of the stories that we've recently heard, Eric Garner, whatnot. Then you know, maybe I update less, and maybe more so than even a Bayesian model, maybe my experience, I wait more so than some story that I hear about from a friend. Um, that could be one explanation, but yeah. Yes? Um, I would be interested to see a couple, the, the results, um, let's say translated into a couple of different measures. <coughs> one would be life expectancy. Another thinking of the uh, brand bag that Mary Jackman gave a month or so ago would be to say, well, how many deaths of black men resulted yeah. from this? Yeah. So we have, um, we have started our life table. <laughs> we think we have an answer, but we, we we should talk <laughs> before we start making that answer publicly available in terms of life expectancy. So yes, absolutely, great points, and great points. Yes, yeah. Uh, so there are two confounders that I was thinking as you were talking. Uh, one is smoking, which I assume you have in a child. Yes, yes. And the other is, if I look at the map on the left, it looks like a map of uh, US mortality, say, on on the least wall. <laughs> this is, this is, this is the, Tuskegee yeah. is the heart of the black belt. It's yeah. the heart of poverty. Yeah. It's the heart of all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, I agree. Yeah. We see a, a change due to something happening in this area at this time, but a lot was, this is a very special area. Yeah. It's a very special time. Yeah, so that, so, that is all true. I mean, the identification strategy, you'd have to come up with something that was really, based on the empirical distribution I showed you, really in Tuskegee or Macon County in 1972, and that, you know, because we're taking out all the black hair fixed effects, we're taking out all the location time trends, we're taking out just being close to Tuskegee and being black. That's actually taken out, so it has to be that time in that place with that demographic group, essentially. So those are the sorts of threats that would have to really be important. And it's it's not implausible to think of one, it's just we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. And what about smoking? So for smoking, thank you. So for smoking as an outcome, we're waiting for them to give the table. So we, we see it as a left-hand side variable. It has the same pattern of utilization. So black men are more likely to be, you know, the, the questions aren't great. They're not about, like, in the last um, year. So they don't have that same sort of contemporaneous flavor. But the questions on, you know, do you smoke 100 cigarettes or something like that, that um, seems to have the same pattern as the utilization, per my recollection, but we're waiting for the disclosure on that. And I guess I'm thinking more that this, the initial time trends is not so <coughs> triple differences, but yes. the initial time trends are going to be largely driven by increased smoking by black men 30 years mm -hmm. in, in 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what's going to drive, I mean, again, it's just our prior, yeah. I think smoking's changing trends this time. Yes. Uh, once you control for people's higher smoking behavior, mm -hmm. does that make all your, all your is your analysis robust to that? So, 
Um, but I, we can do that, I think. It would, yeah, sure. I, I guess what I would think of it is more as a, as a control variable rather than as an outcome. I don't think you're well, going to smoke see that, more, smoke less. Yeah, we see that. So, so we thought they would, and the reason why is because there was a lot of public health messaging around smoking going on at this time. Sort of general's report came out in the late 1960s, and to the extent that you are heed that warning or the reinforcement of that warning by your doctor, that would actually be. So it's we thought of it as actually an outcome. Um, Yes. I think that the map on the right is remarkable and more, in many ways, more remarkable than the map on the left. I mean, the map on the left captures, as you say, a lot of other kinds of things. Because the reason is that I think one of the contributions here is, the form, is in fact, directly about the formation of medical beliefs and the identification, the sense of who you identify with. Yeah. And I think that pushing on that point that it really matters that somebody that you identify with, even if they live a long way away, influences your behavior now, in particular influences medical beliefs and the way that medical beliefs translate into health receiving yeah. behavior is really important. And I guess I would Well, just to respond to that point, I think what you, it's important to keep in mind is that this, I, I take all what you said very seriously, these things are highly correlated because people tend to move closer to where they live. Yeah. So that's so, uh, so uh, a nasty reviewer could say it's two measures of the same thing. And it is, because yes. people tend to move close to where they live, except me from Boston to San Francisco. <laughs> and the second thing, I think, this is a nice, this was um, the first suggestion we got. It's kind of, there's a long sort of literature of using distance as an instrument for lots of different things. But in addition to that, it helps us do things like draw that empirical distribution that we showed you. Yeah. Okay. But, I would also wonder whether people from Mississippi would actually, or blacks from Mississippi, would have had a strong identification of blacks from Alabama because you know, proximity is also so rural and so much yeah. the same. Georgia would be different. Yeah. So one thing we can't. So just this um, on this point, because um, we can't know state, we're not supposed to know state. Right. <laughs> um, but what we can tell you is when we look, and this was this last point that I didn't get to. So when we look when we look in the NHIS data and take among when we define being within black, are you at the lower or higher end of the distribution for within black educational attainment or income? We find that all of our effects are coming from this this lower end of the distribution. So it's the least educated and the poorest that are respond seem to be responding the most in the NHIS data. Responding meaning. They are seeking Their health seeking care. behavior is being the so even though they would be the least likely, the least likely to be informed about potentially, this. depending on the way the information is traveling, they might not be reading the New York Times. They might be reading like the Crusader or whatever the. Or not the, reading at all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.